Awesome. All right. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Our next session is ensuring equitable, equitable access with accessible procurement processes presented by Tom Secret, Accessible Procurement Specialist at the California Community College's Accessibility Center. In this presentation, Tom will cover how accessibility barriers impact students with disabilities, the basic steps in accessible ICT procurement process, and how equally effective alternate access plans, EEAPs, help ensure access. All right, Tom, take it away. Thanks, Elisa. Let me get this started here. And good morning, everyone. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm Tom Seekert, the Procurement Accessibility Specialist at the Accessibility Center. And my presentation is on ensuring equitable access with accessible procurement processes. So let's get started. Um, just a little background um, about myself. Um, I have a little bit of a unique background in that um, I started um, in higher ed as a senior IT buyer and procurement officer at Fresno State. Um, in 2006, I also added the responsibilities of a, the accessible procurement specialist, so I kind of had a dual role. Uh, my last um, um, employment was at CSU Stanislaus, where I was their inaugural accessibility specialist, um, working in the Office of Academic um, Technology. Just wanted to give a quick disclaimer up front. This presentation is not intended to be legal advice. Um, contact legal counsel if you have those type of questions. And we'd like to keep the Q&A. There's 10 minutes at the end. Um, if you can hold your questions for then, that would be great. So let's get started. Um, there's three main topics I plan to cover. Uh, the first is equitable access to ICT, um, ICT accessibility legal requirements. Then lastly, and this is where I'll spend the majority of my time, is um, some of the suggested accessible ICT procurement processes. So equitable access to ICT. Um, we've used this uh, ICT as an acronym um, for information and communication technologies. Uh, it's basically a subset of information technology. And instead of just giving you the definition of what that is, um, I've always found it better and I understand things better with examples. Um, I've listed three categories of um, ICT, and that includes the first one is hardware. This is things such as computers and laptops. Uh, multifunction copiers, uh, printers, scanners, um, something that is really a lot more common these days are information kiosks and self-service and transaction machines, um, and then also digital signage um, for software. Uh, you have things like, this is kind of old school, computer-based software programs, um, and then web and mobile apps, which is kind of where everything is kind of moving, and then learning management systems and all of the um, LTIs and integrated tools within that. You have things like online collaboration tools, such as Slack, Discord, and SharePoint, and then virtual meeting tools, which we've all come to live with, especially the last few years of the pandemic, such as Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams. And then the last category is digital content, where you have email, uh, things like files, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Adobe PDFs, um, multimedia, uh, web pages, and then also social media. So why is this really important? Um, so ICT, the accessibility of it is really just critical because it impacts pretty much every aspect of college life and activities. Um, if you don't have access, you pretty much can't uh, participate. It's not like the old days where things were, you need to go to an office on a college, perhaps fill out a paper form, pretty much everything is moving online if it hasn't already. Um, so I've listed a number of those really critical um, systems that students use uh, all the time, such as your online course environments, the learning management systems like Canvas and others, um, all of the various campus websites, um, say for financial aid, accessing the course catalog, um, course registration, um, finding out about food and housing, and then accessing the student portal for all, all, all manner of student related activities. Another really big area are the library catalogs and databases uh, used in instruction. Um, then lastly, things like event calendars and online ticketing. So one of the things I wanted to highlight was the connection between um, the accessibility efforts that we're doing and the vision for success and the guiding goals. Um, there's a number of these guiding goals that are directly related to uh, the work we're doing to increase accessibility. 
um, such as the first two, especially increasing degree and certificate attainment, helping our students succeed and graduate. Um, also increasing transfers to four year institutions, another big goal. Um, that's something that accessibility and ensuring our students are successful while they're in the CCC is really critical. Um, the fourth bullet, securing gainful employment. That's something that's really critical. And then another big one is closing the equity gaps. So for this one, I wanted to highlight, um, these are statistics um, from 2021 that kind of talk about some of the, um, the challenges that individuals with disabilities are kind of facing. Um, the first three that I want to highlight are unemployment rate. There's this big disparity um, between uh, individuals without a disability and those with a disability and, for example, unemployment rates. Um, so if you looked at high school graduates, you know, people that don't have any college um, experience, uh, people without a disability, their unemployment rate is 6%. And if you compare that for someone with a disability, that's jumps up to 11%. So that's a really big um, disparity there. Um, the thing you can see on this, the numbers is that as you increase your educational attainment, it really has a big impact on all groups, but especially for those people that have a disability. So for example, if we can help our students be successful in the community college, help them get their associate degree, help them get the certificates that they're looking for, their unemployment rate drops from 11% down to 8.5%. That's really a big difference. Um, if we help our students move on to a bachelor's degree or higher, um, if they're able to achieve that, their unemployment rate drops down to 6.8%. So that's a really big difference in uh, their, their outcomes. When, when you look at it, the bottom line is um, by increasing their success and their ability to attain a higher educational achievement, it really, at the bottom line number is, if you look at the annual median household incomes, where the household without a disability is 78,600 in California versus 52,500. So by making sure that our student, all students, especially those with disabilities have access, and are successful, um, we can really move, uh, have a lifetime impact on their ability to increase their education and their economic opportunities. Next, I wanted to briefly get into some of the legal requirements. So I initially I talked about why it's a good thing to do. And this is why things that we have to do. So we're also legally required um, to ensure accessibility of our information and communication technologies. Uh, I listed a number of accessibility laws that apply to us in the California Community Colleges. Uh, the main one that we're going to talk about uh, the most in this presentation is Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, that basically it, it has specific accessibility requirements for the ICT that we develop, use, maintain, or procure. So procurement being the main topic of this presentation. There's also a number of other uh, laws that apply to us, such as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, Title II of Americans with Disabilities Act, and then a couple of government codes, um, which basically say that you know these federal laws apply to us. So at a higher level, um, what does it mean for our, our information communication technologies to be considered accessible? If something's accessible, it means that our users, all of our users, are able to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, which means at the same time, enjoy the same services or benefits in a manner that's equally effective, equally integrated, and substantially equivalent to ease of use. So you may have a system that is inaccessible to some people, but provided you have an alternate means of access that meet all this criteria, it would be considered accessible as well. So you may wonder, well, where does accessible procurement kind of fit in? Um, when you look at, um, there's two main things that some people um, get a little confused sometimes is the accessibility efforts versus accommodation efforts. Uh, the accessibility efforts that we're talking about here are proactive versus the accommodation 
efforts that we do that are reactive. So on proactive accessibility, the whole institution is working proactively to ensure that all persons, including any people that have a disability, can access our technology. Um, we achieve this by following accessibility standards and best practices. And this is kind of critical. A critical distinction is access is proactively provided to everyone, and the access is not individualized to any particular person. And what this does is it promotes independence. So a person with a disability, if we're following these efforts and making it proactively accessible, they don't have to provide anyone documentation. They don't have to ask anyone for help. It just works. Another critical thing is it also doesn't require a person with a disability to disclose that to anyone. If you compare that to um, you know, accommodations or reasonable accommodations, this is something that's really based upon the individual. The individual works with you know, either the disability services office or ADA or 504 compliance office. Uh, individualized adaptations are made for things you know, that can't be anticipated up front so that it works for that particular individual. And basically for the accommodations, it's an interactive process. It is something that's determined on an individual case by case basis. And this does, you know, if you are requesting accommodations, the individuals have to support their request with medical documentation. And then it also requires the individual to disclose a disability. So the next part is actually, I wanna get into actually, how would you implement um, accessible ICT procurement processes? So when it comes to uh, the law that I mentioned earlier, section 508 and its requirements. So there's two requirements when it comes to procurement. And on this screen, I have a, a unicorn. So, you know, if you can find that 100% accessible product, which I'm calling a unicorn, you can just go ahead and get it, right? That That's pretty much, you've satisfied the requirements. Um, but kind of in the real world and what, you know, we've seen is there's not many products out there that are fully accessible. So in that case, what we're required to do is buy the most accessible product that meets our business requirements. This is what's known as the best meets standard or best meets exception. So when you're looking at best meets, it requires a few things. The first is you need to be able to document, well, what are your business requirements? And then also after that, then you look at the market and say, well, what alternatives are there in addition to the product that I was thinking of buying? The other documentation that you need to have is documenting, well, what steps did we take to evaluate the accessibility conformance for each of those products? Because how do you know something best is the most accessible if you have not done some sort of evaluation to determine that. And then that's just the documentation for if something that best meets. What you also have to do, right? So you're able to buy something that's not fully accessible, but the other side of it is you need to also plan for, well, how are we going to proactively um, plan for providing equally effective alternate access for the solutions that are not um, fully accessible up front. So there's three main goals, right? So for procurement processes, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to put processes in place, but what's harder is developing processes that are effective and meaningful. So if you meet, you need to look at meeting these three goals to make sure that your processes that you put in place are actually effective. The first is you need to identify accessibility barriers. That's really critical because without meeting that first goal, the other two goals are just not possible. So goal number two is providing equally effective alternate access, which needs that information about what are the barriers to actually be able to come up with that plan. Then lastly, you need to be able to improve the accessibility of the products over time. This is a collaborative process working with our vendors and this also relies upon identifying specific accessibility barriers that those vendors can then work to make accessible. So what we have are the recommended five steps for accessible procurement. 
Now, I did want to mention up front that if you follow these steps to implement accessible procurement, this matches our accessibility capability maturity model and some of the goals and milestones there. So step one, so you really need to gather accessibility related information um, up front before you make your purchases. And as I mentioned earlier, what that involves is you need to, at this step, define your business needs, research the alternatives, what's available in the marketplace. Um, you also need to gather accessibility documentation at this stage, which is things you may have heard of the term VPAT, which is a voluntary product accessibility template, um, also known as an accessibility conformance report, ACRs. So the at this step, your purchase, the person that wants to make the purchase should be asking the vendor for that documentation at the same time that they're asking the vendors for price quotes, statement of works, and things like that. And then the last part of this is you need to gather use case information. I know when I was a procurement officer, I would get requests by technology and the documentation wouldn't have any information about, you know, how is this technology going to be used? What's its purpose? Who are the users? How many is it required? So that information is really critical um, if you're going to review something for accessibility and you need to get that up front. So for step one, there's some best practices. These are things, you know, that we've kind of learned uh, implementing these processes um, at other uh, universities. And the, the first overall thing is that it's recommended that you develop an integrated IT review process. So what this is, is it's basically, it's a holistic approach to IT governance. So instead of just reviewing something for accessibility, there's a number of other areas that it really makes sense to review at the same time, such as information security, such as enterprise support, such as does IT already have a similar system in place and we would you know, I, the IT organization, from a support standpoint, it makes more sense to direct that uh, purchase requester to use something that is already existing and in place. So how do you actually implement such a review process? Uh, typically, what you would do is you would create two things, a review form and then the related approval workflows. So the review form is something that you would require all people looking to purchase something complete and have it fully reviewed before there's an approval to then purchase that item. So the IT review form typically would be created in a, a ticketing system, such as a Zendesk, a ServiceNow, a ShareWell, a Team Dynamics, And it would ask it just in one form, all the key information, right? So what is it? What's the purpose? How many users? How's it gonna be used? And then it would add some of those other things, such as, are there confidential data that is stored or transmitted? Or do you need help implementing this? Do we need to um, um, provision a server to support it? So getting all that information up front. And then the other thing to do is to design your approval workflows so that the people making the, re the various reviews, um, it matches the IT governance and what the rules are currently. So do you want, um, someone in your IT organization to be able to say approve or deny and then have it not proceed? Or do you want to have the approval continue on to all the different possible review types? So step two, and so this is where you have someone that has been um, designated as your accessibility reviewer. Um, this person would receive that accessibility documentation that was collected in step one along with the use case information to give it some context. And the thing that that person would do is determine what's the impact. Is it a high impact solution, uh, such as a, um, a Title IX software training that all students need to take, it's required, and if they don't finish it, then perhaps a hold is put on their registration? Or is it you know, a low impact? Is it perhaps a faculty member who has a piece of software for research? And they're the only individual that's ever going to use it, right? Which would be definitely a low or very low impact. So based upon that, the reviewer determines the impact, which then drives, okay, now what types of review activities um, should we do to validate the accessibility of, of this product? 
or not, depending on impact. So for step two, kind of some, uh, the best practice here is, so you really need to prioritize your efforts because there's just so much technology that's being procured. Um, you really need to have something that kind of guides that process. So this is what we call an impact matrix where you, you map things like high impact, medium impact, low impact that describes what activities will you do what documentation will you require or not? So for example, that I used, if you had the low impact, probably what you would have in your impact matrix is you would try to collect a VPAT or ACR, and that's the extent of it. And then if you looked at, say, the high impact example I gave of the Title IX software, then you would have a whole lot more requirements such as, okay, you collected your VPAT Perhaps you're going to require third-party testing by um, an outside vendor. You're going to have a live vendor demo. You're going to have contract language with an accessibility roadmap and things like that. So by having this defined impact matrix, it allows you to have a consistent process. It's rational. You could explain it to say someone from Office for Civil Rights. Well, why do you do what you do based upon the different impact levels? And bottom line, it's a just more effective use of resources. So step three, so I really want to highlight this one. If you remember nothing else from my presentation, remember this um, step. And more specifically, if your process does not identify accessibility bugs, it is not effective. It's not meaningful. So what we've seen over the years is, you know, people might have a process where they collect a bunch of documentation or what have you, but that's it. It really, um, the next level is no matter what, accessibility review or testing that's done, the goal of all of it is finding specific accessibility barriers or bugs. That's the true test of whether you have a meaningful procurement process. So as I mentioned in the previous step, based upon impact, the person doing the accessibility review will recommend which of these um, testing or review activities will take place anywhere from the most simple, least in-depth, which is doing a critical review of the accessibility or conformance report, all the way up to requiring, say, a third-party expert-level deep-dive accessibility audit, and then everything in between, depending on you know, what the particulars are for that item. Once you've found the accessibility barriers, those are then used to communicate that information to the vendor. It also drives um, the reviewer making a recommendation for what accessibility requirements should be in the contract or purchase order. So for this step, um, there's a couple best practices. And the first one I wanna, want to really emphasize is do not do research and development for your vendors. The best alternative to that is require your vendors to do a live product accessibility demo. And what this is, this is not a free form, let the vendor do whatever they want. This is a scripted demo where you define up front, here's all the different things the vendor needs to show you with a screen reader, um, show you keyboard only focus and keyboard only access, um, show you zooming to 200 plus percent. There's no way to fake it, right? This really is a no cost, easy way to get a really good sense of how inaccessible or accessible the solution is. So as I mentioned earlier, identifying accessibility barriers is really critical. So you cannot just take a vendor's word. Um, one thing that many of you may know already if you're familiar with a VPAT or the Accessibility Conformance Report is vendors will say anything. And oftentimes they'll say, my solution fully supports accessibility. There's no barriers whatsoever. The reality is that's almost never true. Um, and by identifying specific accessibility barriers, that's the only real way to understand the real risk or impact to users, who's likely to be impacted by those barriers. And specifically, these last two points is you need that information to create an accessibility roadmap. Um, which is basically a contractual document that a vendor agrees to address the specific and to fix 
the specific sex, uh, sorry, accessibility barriers within a defined order and a defined timeline. And then lastly, you need those accessibility barriers to create what's known as equally effective alternate access for users that will be impacted by those barriers. So step four, and this is really critical. So this is um, our obligation. We have to provide equally effective alternate access for the ICT that we buy that's not fully accessible. And the way you do that is by developing a plan to provide that. So this is a really common thing. What is a, what is a, what I've often seen is someone will say in a document that they call a plan, well, we're gonna provide an accommodation, that's our plan. Well, that's not a plan. So what a plan is, is a something where upfront you've thought about if a person couldn't access this technology, what's an equally effective alternate way of providing that same information or those same benefits? This is not something that's easy. It requires creative people. It requires experts that understand the learning objectives and things like that. Once that plan is created or information is created, it's really important to also distribute it. I've seen it where some colleges, they would come up with this plan, but then it wouldn't be disseminated to all the people that would need that information, such as disability services office, such as the purchase requester, the person that's implementing the technology or the IT support that needs to implement it. So the best practices for this step um, are related to creating those equally effective access plans. It requires collaboration. This cannot be done in isolation. This is not something that could be properly done by, say, just an accessibility expert. What you need is that multidisciplinary uh, group of people. So in the case of instructional software, that would involve the faculty member or the people doing instruction, because only those subject matter experts are the ones that could tell you, well, is this alternate means of access? Um, does that meet the same course learning objectives and things like that? And then once you have that plan, you, you need to um, make sure it meets these requirements. Number one, is it timely? So that alternate access for your end users, does that provide them access prior to or the same time as non-disabled users? If it doesn't meet that, that's not gonna meet legal muster for providing equally effective alternate access. Another aspect of it is also, does it provide the same benefits, right? So does your alternate means of access provide a similar benefit for the end user? And then the next two are really critical too, because this is something where people often um, get into trouble, where you also need to make sure that this alternate access doesn't result in treating the person with a disability differently or having a disparate impact, a differential impact on the person with a disability. So the best example I would give is, um, say you had a online ticketing system where a person without a disability could use it and access it 24 seven, 365 from anywhere. But for example, an alternate access plan might say, well, the individual needs to go to this office at the college between these hours and talk to these specific people. That would fail on both those counts. It treats the person differently and it has a very different impact on what you're asking them to do to have that same access. And then the last step that we'll get into is including accessibility specific language in the contract or PO. So it's really important and I also understand this is probably only something you can do for procurements that are, you know, the higher impact, the higher dollar amount. Um, a vendor that's providing something for $100 is not going to change their terms and conditions. That's just not going to happen. But the, the starting point for that is ensuring that accessibility related provisions are in your general terms and conditions. I've looked at a number of um, the California community colleges and they already have that, which is great. But the other aspect is for those high impact uh, procurements, especially putting in the contract supplemental provisions that spell out 
um, accessibility requirements specific to that product or acquisition. This is really where you have the leverage prior to establishing the contract to get the vendor on board with making those changes. So as I mentioned, so the best practice is having those supplemental provisions, especially for high impact. And I've listed a few of the things that would probably be in those or would often be in those uh, supplemental provisions, um, such as the vendor agrees to regularly provide updated accessibility conformance reports as they make significant updates to their product or solution. They would also um, commit to contractually addressing the, the bugs that were identified in what's known as the accessibility roadmap that defines what's going to be fixed when and, and in what order. And that's a material term of the contract. And then the other thing that would typically be in there would be how the vendor is going to support uh, end users with the disabilities, you know, and define how the end users could report problems, what their help desk, um, how they provide different means of support for especially people that have a disability, documentation for workarounds, and um, things like that. So with that, we are to our questions and answer. Are there any questions? I haven't been monitoring the chat. Hi, Tom. We just got one in the chat. It's by Candace Knudsen. It would be helpful to have this EEAP and procurement process adopted to include the process of classroom faculty driven requests that are often directed through frontline folks like DE coordinators who must then advocate to IT for adoption slash purchase of the software and even OERs. Yeah, great, Candace. That's a, that's a great point. And um, we will definitely have that um, within our capability maturity model. Um, we address um, things that are, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the things that are currently the classroom and faculty driven requests. So um, things related to instruction, uh, those technologies and how they have, you know, different workflows than say the traditional things that are um, purchased. So that will be addressed through the capability and maturity model. And we will have, um, we'll have guidance and some other things to go along with that. Hopefully that answers your question, Candace. Hi, this is Catrelia from LACCD. Yes. I have my hand up for a minute here. Um, I'll take it down, but I do have a question and, and I do not uh, service, uh, provide services, training services for uh, students particularly, but I am the training and development program manager for our division of HR. So mm -hmm. accessibility is a big issue. Uh, we are getting ready to launch a uh, LMS specifically geared towards uh, career development or advancement um, with certifications, different things like that. The vendor that we're using is providing quite a bit of resources for the content that we are curating, but not all of the courses are compliant because they're, they are a broker of various digital publishers, okay? My right. question is, <laughs> how do we, of the 19,000 different courses that we're going to be uh, looking at, how do we uh, qualify the content or make it accessible in those cases for uh, those publishers who may not have the VPAT in place? And I know it's a different protocol when you're dealing with uh, from students as opposed to faculty and staff, but you know, what are your thoughts on that, on how we could at least come close to providing alternative uh, assistance for those uh, 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 individuals who have, have disabilities and for online uh, uh, courses? Right. So if I understand your question correctly, you mentioned that some of them or maybe many of them don't have the VPATs or accessibility conformance reports to even Correct. give you a sense of accessibility. Uh, several do, but not okay. all. And so how do we get around that? I mean, what, what, what do we do with that in, the, in those cases? Right. So obviously it'd be preferable 
Um, we did have that information, but the bottom line is in either case, we need to know, right? We need to be able to evaluate the accessibility of those resources. Um, I mean, ideally you would want to know which ones weren't and then perhaps find a vendor that had ones that were more accessible, but understanding that's not always possible as well. Sure. Um, I mean, I've had situations where we would have training materials or um, solutions for doing training that were not accessible. So the content that's in there was not accessible, right? And what we did then was we took that um, and developed, took the content from there uh -huh. and created alternate media of that same content that's delivered through a different delivery mechanism that was accessible, Got if it. that makes sense. So yes. there's so there's so many layers of it, right? So the, the solution that delivers the content, oftentimes that interface itself is inaccessible. So wow. that users of a screen reader, or what have you, can't even get to the content. So that's the workaround that I'm familiar with and I've seen done where, okay, we're gonna convert that content into another way of a delivery mechanism for the, the end users to access that same content. Perfect. But if the vendor doesn't even represent what their level of accessibility is, I mean, especially if it's something that seems like it's kind of high impact, right? Because otherwise those users can't access it you kind of just need to be able to have someone do an assessment to determine, okay, how accessible is it? And then what is our plan to provide an alternate way of accessing that same content, maybe in a different delivery mechanism or platform? Okay. I like that idea. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, there is a question in the chat about equally effective alternate access. Um from Penny, and I am going to suggest, Penny, that we talk offline because we could do a whole hour plus just on your question to answer it. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that it was there, but for sake of time, we'll move on to Cindy, who has her hand raised. Do you have examples of uh what we should include in our TNCs on our purchase orders or of accessibility contract uh, stipulations that we might want to consider in different situations? Sure. So I would say stay tuned. That's definitely something that we will um, be developing very shortly and we will provide to the campuses. Um, it'll be provided in part perhaps through the implementation guide, but otherwise we will definitely have a lot of resources that we'll be putting on our website um, in support of kind of rolling out our capability maturity model. And that's definitely a big one that we'll cover. Thank you. And uh -huh. Cindy, we do have them, but they're just not tailored for the, for to be generic yet for putting out. So that's why yeah. Tom is putting yeah. that off. Um, and then Nate asked a question in the chat, but he also has his hand raised. So we'll let Nate proceed. Uh, thanks. So I just have a specific question, but it might be useful to kind of put this into practice regarding an LTI that we recently reviewed at VPAT for. And what it is, it's a, it's a course that is a sign language class. Um, mm -hmm. And the sign language class has videos as part of it. Uh, the videos themselves, they play in real time. They're intentionally not captioned because the idea is to not allow the students to, to read the captions. It's, it's the learning tool. Mm -hmm. um, also, they are not audio described for the blind. Um, and the, I, I'm not sure about this, but I believe the logic behind that is there is simply not a way of doing that efficiently, uh, like describing the precision of the hand movements within the amount of time uh, as they're progressing uh, throughout during the video. So um, thoughts on that, like should this LTI not be allowed? Because if a blind person were to take this class, they would find it inaccessible? Or is it okay to have the LTI involved and in, uh, added to the course and come up with an accommodation for someone who's blind? So I'll, I'll let some of my other colleagues weigh in as well. I, I would say that requiring the solution itself to meet those accessibility requirements would involve a fundamental alteration of how the, the software is intended to work and kind of the how it's intended to be used in instruction, right? So the pedagogical um, purpose of it. Um, I, I would lean towards providing an alternate way for someone that 
you know, that wouldn't be accessible for them. And the other thing you kind of need to look at are what are the essential requirements of that course, right? Does it require? I'm not suggesting that it does for this one, um, but that's important to consider that as well if you're ever looking at something like fundamental alteration. And fundamental alteration does not exclude the entire LTI, only the portions of it that would be fundamentally altering the outcome of the learning outcome. So navigating around within the LTI is not a fundamental alteration. The video that is not described in this case would be the fundamental alteration. Um, so there, that's, and we can get into a whole probably half day on uh, all of the different um, exceptions that, such as fundamental alteration and um, mil uh, military intelligence. I still want somebody to, to try and purchase something for national security. I want to buy a tank or something. Um, but um, what we presented today was a general high-level overview. There's a lot of nuances to procurement. Um, and there will be more information coming, and I see a lot more sessions on procurement in general. Um, and with that, I don't know. So let me just answer more one questions. more question if I can, Don. Um, I know there's a, a number of ones here, but um, June mentioned, Jude, sorry, mentioned, I'm also interested in more about EEAAPs. I am a librarian and we cannot avoid uh, providing databases. Uh, no, no database is a unicorn and these are 24 by 7 products. How can I learn more about EEAAPs for creative solutions to equally effective access? I would mirror what Don said earlier and that we can and will be definitely providing more guidance and training on EEPs. It's such a big area and it's so critical. And it would definitely, you know, there's a lot we could talk about. There is a question here. Do you have a sample document that targets a specific product, say Canvas or Zoom? I think we're going to need a little more information about that question in order to answer it. So my question was in uh, regards to the steps that Tom just mentioned, step one, two, and three, and what are the mandatory questions that we need to have in our document when we are procuring a software, uh, software application or software tool? Right. So um, I know myself and other team members um, have some examples that we can give um, of ones that we've been involved in implementing. So we have a number of those questions that you can kind of adapt and adopt, you know, as you see fit. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. We're just still working on making them into a version that is available to post. So. No, that's a great question. They're all great questions, but that's a great question. And Tom, did you cover uh, what happens if a vendor doesn't even have a VP? Right. I don't think I explicitly, I think I kind of touched on it a little bit, but it really kind of, so okay, we tried to get a VPAT, the vendor doesn't have it or they're not willing to provide it. The then what really kind of depends on the impact, right? If it's something that's low impact, not many people or very few people are ever gonna use it. The then what is probably you're not gonna do anything. And as Sean mentioned, you find another product if it's possible, right? But for the higher impact things, then what is you need to have a way, an alternate way of determining the level of accessibility, which, you know, the, the live vendor demo that I talked about is one of those great ways. Um, so, 
So in the context of, say, a high impact one where you had a number of different vendors, some provided it, some didn't, or the quality of the VPATs was differing amongst the vendors, that live vendor demo really evens the playing field and makes it much easier to compare products and their accessibility. That, that's one way. And then um, my colleague, Sean Jordison also said, or you can tell them you won't purchase until they're compliant. That's another possibility. We have um, approximately four more minutes left in this session. So we have an opportunity for one or two more questions left. So if there's not a question right this second, um, I'll make a quick comment. Um, my colleague Sean mentioned that a lot of vendors offer uh, roadmaps, but they're often not held accountable, right? So that's kind of um, part of the process is you, okay, it's fine to put it in a contract, but if you don't have a procedure to follow up and see where they are, are they delivering on it? Then it kind of becomes a little bit meaningless. So you need to have a, a follow-up process as well. And then Scott, um, I agree with his statement. He says, I would not purchase a product without a VPAT for a high impact products. Even a demo is not satisfactory. What happens if they change the product design the next day? Agreed. So another aspect of that, and I didn't cover this, is that the high impact procurements, a lot of the times you would want to um, use a request for proposal or a formal bidding process. And within that, you would, you would screen those vendors out because you would make a mandatory submission requirement of a VPAT. You don't submit it, you're out. So that's how I would handle that and recommend that. And the last. Really quick, if we have a second, uh, colleague Sean Jordison said, beware of the infamous conforms with exceptions. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, what are those exceptions and how does it impact people is the question. To me, what's almost even worse is conforms and it has no supporting comments, which makes it just not, um, not believable. And then I, I did the slide here to also promote uh, the Community of Accessibility Allies meeting coming up February 15th as well. So thank you, Tom. I did um, put the registration link and listserv email for the community um, for accessibility allies in the chat. So thank you for your overview on accessible procurement processes. As Angela mentioned, if you uh, if, if anyone's more interested in hearing more on this topic of procurement in our summer workshop, consider including a comment requesting this topic on the post workshop survey uh, that will be sent tomorrow after the securities workshop. So we will be taking a short break.